This episode is brought to you by Aperol, Italy's iconic aperitif. You know summer has officially arrived when you take that first sip of an Aperol spritz. It's a little bitter, a little sweet, and perfectly balanced. Whether you're at a bar or on the patio with friends, Aperol spritz is the iconic orange cocktail to celebrate the season. Aperol, together we joy. To learn more, visit Aperol.com. Aperol liquor, 11% alcohol per volume, 22 proof, 2022 Campari America, New York, New York. Please enjoy responsibly. Votes are pouring in across the state, and the candidates are making their closing arguments for every race, from governor to Congress to state legislators. And as all this plays out, the ads on your screens, the mailers in your mailbox, the signs on seemingly every open corner are targeting the most coveted block of voters in Arizona, those who refuse to be beholden to either camp. I've always considered myself independent. I've always been an independent. I'm an issues-based voter. About a year ago, I changed now to independent completely. I switched from Democrat, so it's been 10 years. I want to have my option, and that's why I'm going to be an independent. These are the voices of Arizona's independent voters. They come from many walks of life. Some grew up here. Others moved here. Many once belonged to one of the major parties, a few have been lifelong independents. It's a community that often confounds both the right and the left. Their collective unpredictability is the obsession of all candidates with a D or an R next to their names. Voters who don't put any letter next to their names are considered independents. In Arizona, about 34% fit that bill. There are about 1.4 million Republicans statewide and almost as many who are independents. There are 1.3 million registered Democrats in the state. Independents typically settle Arizona's closest races, and today you'll hear from a few of them about why they aren't a Democrat or a Republican. You're listening to The Gaggle, a podcast by the Arizona Republic and azcentral.com. Each week, we put Arizona's politics under the magnifying glass with reporters, experts, and special guests. Today, we're listening to some of you. Kaylee Monahan, who helps produce the gaggle, chatted with a number of independents, and she's going to help us walk through what they said. Kaylee, welcome to the hot seat. It's great to be here. Thank you. So depending on which poll you look at and when it was taken, it looks like independents are leaning to Republican Carrie Lake in the governor's race and to Democrat Mark Kelly in the Senate race. Let's begin with how many people you spoke with and where they're from. Sure. So I spoke with little over a dozen registered independents who span the state from Flagstaff at the top to Tucson down at the bottom. Uh, many of them are transplants from other places, but have lived in the state for some time. There were others who are newer to the state and just a handful are true purebred Arizonans with family ties going back to the territorial days. The age range spanned from people in their 20s all the way up to their 80s, and they were fairly evenly split between men and women. Okay. So how are the people that you spoke with planning to vote or have voted? Of the people that I spoke with, and mind you, this is just a tiny sliver of a very large voting block, most of them are leaning towards Democratic candidates or are still a bit undecided. A few people I talked to didn't want to say outright who they were voting for, but then they would add something like, based on our conversation, you can probably tell who I'll vote for. Okay. And what did you surmise with those individuals? They also appeared to be leaning toward Democrats in major races. However, I noticed a lot of distress and basically people pinching their noses as they fill out their ballots. 31-year-old Mandy Snowden from South Phoenix has typically leaned slightly towards the right as an independent, but she's finding it increasingly difficult to vote Republican. I voted for Katie Hobbs. It was kind of a reluctant vote. But um, I'm really concerned about the level of uh, Republican extremism, basically down the ballot, which is why I ended up um, choosing the Democratic candidate for most of 
the areas that I've chosen because there just seems to be a lot of extremism on the Republican side and the Republican candidates. I get very uneasy with candidates who seem to be in lockstep with Donald Trump. It's not an automatic dismissal, but it's a big um, check mark, <laughs> not in their favor. Jim Morrison is 86 and has not only voted in many elections, but has worked in government across the country. He's been both a Democrat and a Republican, but is settled as an independent. He's not happy about the choices on the ballot, particularly for governor. Very distressed that uh, Hobbs is refused to debate. Very distressed about that, which again shows a disrespect for the voter, in my view. Uh, that's my view, but it may not, not, not everyone agrees with that. But uh, that's bad. And fellow no grinders, I don't see this election doing much to put Arizona in the right direction. I really don't. When we spoke, Jim was still working on his ballot and hadn't made all his final decisions as of yet. As for 58-year-old Ellen Rausch of Tucson, she was also still mulling over her choices. I did circle Katie Hobbs, even though I did try to talk, uh, you know, I tried to reach out to them and say, how does she feel about open primaries? You know, um, they don't know a lot about Carrie Lake, but, you know, it, it doesn't sound like she's for me. The only reason I'm voting for Mark Kelly as a Democrat, because I've actually met him and I actually met Gabby Gifford. <laughs> like they, to me, really, just from a personal level, seem, seem trustworthy. And even if I don't agree with their politics, they seem like good people anyways. So that helps if you meet them. The only one that I've been able to kind of track is Adrian Santos, Secretary of State. He's kind of like the only one in his voter guide that I got that even addresses the idea that we could be doing better in terms of, you know, preserving the integrity of elections and our democracy. Nathan Cole is 28 and lives in Phoenix. He was formerly registered as a Republican, but switched to independent. He identifies as having more libertarian leanings, but he had this to say about who he's voting for in the governor's race. Probably Hobbs. Definitely not Carrie Lake because of the electoral denialism, which is my first and biggest point this election cycle, which is disgusting that I have to basically put inflation, abortion, tax law, like human rights, tax laws, border security, all of these actual problems that our state and our country faces basically confront the biggest problem right now, which are people that are denying the foundation of our democracy. And for the Senate race? Yeah, uh, Mark Kelly, probably just due to the fact that Blake Masters uh, has said things in the past that are just off-putting. I don't know if he's changed his mind, but he's gone back and forth with saying the election was stolen and, and it was not. So he raised up some good points. I watched the, the debate they had in a perfect world. The libertarian candidate uh, would win. I think he had absolutely great points, again, with that small, limited government. But yeah, I learned that lesson this last presidential election. Jacqueline Diwali lives in Tucson. The 47-year-old started voting as a Democrat when she was 18, but switched pretty quickly to independent. She identifies as a social liberal and fiscal conservative, which was a common thread among many of the voters I spoke with. I voted for Katie Hobbs. I was not super excited to vote for her. I feel she's kind of been a ghost <laughs> in this election. I don't I don't know if she's getting poor guidance or if she really is timid. Um, I'm disappointed that this is the best that the Democratic Party could come up with. I don't know what is in their pipeline, but whoever is running their pipeline needs to maybe think a little bigger 
Um, I, I would have voted Democrat regardless. Um, I'm not excited about Kari Lake. I think she's a lot of bluster. I don't think there's anyone there <laughs> behind behind the facade. And I just don't want to see the chaos that was on the national stage brought even closer to me at the state and then local level. I just, I don't think I can handle it. <laughs> so we will see, but I'm, I'm not feeling super excited about it. I voted for Kelly. Again, not super excited about him. I, I tend to be a little bit more conservative when it comes to gun rights. And while I understand and appreciate his position with firearms and to some extent agree with it, um, again, it's another one of those things where it's become all or nothing in absolutes. And there's a lot of gray in between, and we're not looking at that. And uh, But <laughs> the flip side was... Um, Blake Masters. <laughs> so I just, again, I just couldn't do it. I just, I just couldn't. 48 year old Phoenician Carolyn Van Oosten said this I definitely voted for uh, Kitty Hobbs. And, you know, there, it's unfortunately one of those things, you know, going back to your point about if there's something burning or it, it, a topic burning. And in this case, it's more is there a candidate that really excites you or not? No, unfortunately, there hasn't been that. I haven't really seen that. I mean, it's like, where are all the, you know, where are all the good people? Where have they gone? I've always been a registered independent voter. So it's funny story. Uh, so I'm from the Dominican Republic, born and raised. And then I went to University of North Carolina to do my undergraduate work. At that point, I was 18. I, I wasn't registered to vote. Um, I became a citizen at that time. I had residency prior because my dad is a uh, Cuban exile. So I, even though I was in the Dominican Republic, I was able to have residency status here in the United States. Um, so I became a citizen, but I didn't register to vote. <laughs> and it wasn't actually until I moved to Arizona that I actually got interested in. And that was one of the things that was eye-opening when I had to decide then and there just to register to vote that you had to decide what party you were. And I said, no, I, I, I want to have my options, and that's why I'm going to be an independent. Seventy-three-year-old Paul, who asked us not to use his last name, lives in North Phoenix. He was formerly Republican before switching to independent, and he's gone back and forth over the years, registering as one or the other. I'm going to vote for Mark Kelly. Blake Masters is, in my view, in my opinion. Is he's he's bought and paid for by uh, possibly one of the most despicable characters in American politics today. So I mean, you know, here again, you know, you've got a guy that's he's put fifteen or twenty million dollars in the Masters campaign. Where's the uh, assurance that Arizona citizens are going to come before his benefactors, his financial benefactors? So. And of course, the other issue, too, is that there's already too many candidates on the ticket and already in the Senate that have a financial uh, commitment, if you will, or financial commitment from the same person. And uh, there's no point in allowing one guy to hold three senators. Bill Regner lives in Clarkdale and has served as a committee man for the town. He politely declined to say who he plans to vote for but alluded that I could probably figure out his leanings. Anybody who is an election denier did not get my vote. Uh, anybody who believes that there are these conspiracies out there, uh, you know, who ascribe to the QAnon kind of conspiracies and things like that, would not get my vote. Fifty-seven-year-old Susan Lassiter Lyons moved with her wife from California to Florence nearly a year ago. I'm not voting for uh, Carrie Lake. I'm voting for, plan to vote for Katie Hobbs. Um, and honestly, she caught my eye during the 2020 election when she was on the national news, like a couple of times a day, giving us the Arizona updates. She kind of came across as like the voice of reason and a real cool head in a very emotionally and politically charged time period. And it made an impression. And so when we came out here and I realized that, you know, she was running for governor, I was like, oh, okay, well, this 
probably is going to be a no-brainer depending on who the other side runs. And now it's definitely a no-brainer based on who the other side is running. And to continue in that same vein, I plan to vote for Mark Kelly for the exact same reason. But it's because he is for Arizona. It seems to me, based on what I know of him and what I've studied about the issues and how he's voted and how he behaves and you know some of the things that he says and does, it's like he's just not blindly following party. He's just not blindly following leadership. He's making independent decisions based on the good of his constituency. And as a voter and one of his constituents, that's exactly what I want. Okay, let's be clear on this. No one you spoke with said they would vote for Carrie Lake, Blake Masters, or Mark Fincham. Is is that correct? That is correct. Uh, But again, I want to stress that these answers are not reflective of all independents. And also to clarify, the people I spoke with either reached out directly to us here at the gaggle, and that was in response to our call out for independent voters, or they were connected to me by the organization independent voters for Arizona. We didn't solicit people who only felt one way or another. It's just a matter of who did reach out and agree to speak with us. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. At the top of the episode, I mentioned that some of these individuals had switched from a major party to becoming an independent. How common is that among the people that you spoke with? It's extremely common. Uh, The majority of the people I spoke with were either registered Republican or Democrat before switching to independent. Here's Jim Morrison again. I'm an original hillbilly from West by God, Virginia. (laughs) And I I spent my early youth in West Virginia, undergraduate college, a little HBCU in West Virginia, and uh, went in the Army after ROTC. And after that, I started working for the federal government. Initially in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, a dozen years there, and then transferred to Washington, D.C. And I was registered as a Democrat for many years. Once I left government, started my business, I was quite active politically as a Democrat back east in the Washington, D.C., Maryland area. I became a little disaffected with the Democrats, with the Clinton scandals and the way the party rallied around him, no questions asked. And I was expecting, I guess, from my experience, something more akin to the way the Republicans dealt with with Nixon. But we didn't get that. But anyway, I moved to Arizona, where at that time, Arizona had a fairly vibrant, moderate Republican Party, five women in charge of government, I think, at the time. Uh, And I thought, I think I'll register Republican. And uh, I did. And then I thought, well, I think I'll get on Florida back. So I go to a precinct meeting. And next thing you know, I'm a precinct committee man, then a precinct captain, then an area captain. Uh, So I was enjoying that. And we didn't move, but they changed the district lines. And all of a sudden, (laughs) I was in a district that was the Cave Creek conspiracy (laughs) theorist, weird propeller heads. I, I thought... What is happening? These are not the people I was interacting with in North Scottsdale or Scottsdale from. So I thought, you know, I, I think this whole thing is going off the well. Although I had been watching politics, I've been an avid student of politics for a long time. And you could see the contention and the animus just building, building, building. I think some of it started with Nixon, who I think was really hated by a subset of the population. Carter, where I work, but nice man, wonderful, honorable person, not effective. <laughs> After that, you got Reagan, and who the Washington political establishment never accepted. And you could see everything building. So I think this animus has been building over a long period of time, but it's now gotten totally out of control. But as I say, I think around 2000. Oh, six, five or six, I decided I can't be up in any party anymore. Certainly not giving time and labor <laughs> to that effort. So I registered as uh, independent. And I, I'm not a leaner. <laughs> I'm, I'm committed independent. <laughs> I also spoke with 65-year-old Lisa Schnebley-Heidinger. 
She's lived all over the state but calls Flagstaff home. Her family roots go deep into Arizona's history. Born and raised, my great-grandfather named the town of Sedona after my great-grandma. And so as annoyed as I can get with Arizona, I will never leave it. I switched from Democrat, but I have been in both parties and have been told even when I looked into running for state legislature, you'll never get elected because you party jump too many times. Um, and that could be true. But it's it's so easy to switch. And sometimes you want a candidate from another party. So I'm and I was a journalist. So I was I was unregistered for a while. And I am not a party loyalist. Earlier, we heard from Paul from North Phoenix. Here he is explaining his thoughts on switching to independent from Republican. I've kind of uh, gone back and forth between independent and Republican. I mean, for years and years and years, I was a Republican uh, from the, the time I first was eligible to vote when I was 21, when I was still in the military. Uh, and I was a Republican for decades. But uh, I've always, you know, taken the personal position anyway that, you know, I'd vote for the, the right person rather than the right party. And while I voted for Richard Nixon in 72, I voted for Jimmy Carter 76 and Ronald Reagan in 80 and 84. So, you know, it's much more the, the person than the party. I was a lifelong Republican. This is Richard Sinclair from Scottsdale. He's 83 years young. I was, my youth, a very active, I was involved with the young Republicans when I was at college. I got to introduce Barry Goldwater at our state convention. But I would say I've always been a fiscal conservative, a social moderate. Well, there was a time or two in Pennsylvania where I actually supported or voted for a Democrat here or there. Again, basically, who's going to do the better job? Until about 12 years ago, you know, an active registered Republican. His attitude towards the Republican Party changed during George W. Bush's second term in office. The Republicans really started to irritate me. They were spending money like drunken sailors and really not accomplishing much. That didn't trigger. It was when our friends here in Arizona did the, what, 1070, that one, let's let's stop and arrest anybody that's got the skin of any color thing. And Sheriff Joe is wonderful. You know, that was the thing that triggered it. I, I went up to change my registration based on that. Jacqueline DeVoli, who we also heard from earlier, explained why she switched from Democrat to Independent. I was a registered Democrat when I turned 18, and then um, I did my internship at the Capitol. And after that, I thought to myself, you know, I'm not super excited about what I saw here. <laughs> so I switched to Independent. I did the internship um, via a program the legislature offers for students. And you're either assigned to Republican staff or Democratic staff. And I was assigned to Democratic Senate staff. So I got to cover both the Democratic caucuses and the Senate in the Senate and the Republican. And it was just disheartening to see even back then. And this is way back in 1996, <laughs> the amount of just entrenchment and even the lobbying that happens. And don't get me wrong, there were good people on both sides, but it was very obvious to me that the people who were in the middle, either not one or the other, kind of got lost in the shuffle there. And while I generally tend to lean more to the left for social issues, I'm a little bit more towards the right on financial issues. So there's not really a place for me. I didn't really feel at home. And being that in Arizona, you can switch to register with a party for certain primaries. To me, that was an advantage. So I have taken advantage of that if I felt strongly enough about a primary candidate or didn't like a primary candidate and wanted to use that strategy. So I've done that in the past, but mostly I've stayed independent since then. Al Bell lives in Peoria. And when he came to Arizona, he registered as an independent. I lived in California up until 15 years ago. And my 
the first president I voted for was the first term of uh, Dwight Eisenhower. That was a while ago. And I was a registered Republican and, and was for 52 years. But I never voted the straight party ticket. And uh, over time, especially moving into the 90s, I realized that I was less and less satisfied with the candidates offered by the Republican Party and my proportion of voting shifted far more to the Democratic side because there were no other choices of any consequence. People would talk about us, sometimes at us, but seldom with us. And, and of course, independents don't make it real easy because we're, by our personal choice, we're not part of a, a system. So we're independent. We're all over the place. Physically, politically, you name it. Okay, so I'm picking up a theme here. A lot of frustration with how both parties operate. Exactly. Nearly all the independents I spoke with are unhappy with our country's mudslinging politics. They view both parties as entrenched in extremes, or they see the Republican Party specifically as going too extreme and the Democrats as lacking any real leadership or direction. Here's Bill Regner of Clarkdale, Arizona. Well, I'm a political science major in college, and so um, government has been always important to me. I serve as an elected official, so I believe in government. I believe in good governments. And so I have to say that my top concern right now is uh, saving our, our democracy. I, I think it's in peril. I think it's in danger. I want to be vigilant to uh, preserve it. Bill also switched from a major party to an independent. He was formerly a registered Democrat, but in 2016 changed to independent. It was something that I was coming to for a long period of time, just a frustration with uh, the polarization that I see. I'm an elected official in Clarkdale. I've been on the Clarkdale Town Council for almost 12 and a half years. I'm about to retire. And in campaigning, I would just find the polarization so extreme. Of course, Town Council in Clarkdale is a nonpartisan election, but you would find people who just want, had to know your party, and that, would, that was the sole determinant of whether they would support you. As it turned out, there was an event, and that uh, event was I was had an opportunity to run for a, a different office, and I contacted the Democratic Party in Arizona to ask for some assistance with just some voter registration data so I could make an informed decision about what my chances were. There hadn't been a Democrat elected in this area in, in memory. I was not responded to. And so I decided, well, here I am, a already an elected official, and my party wasn't able to respond to me uh, to help me make a decision. So I decided at that point that um, I would leave the Democratic Party and, and, and be an independent. 28-year-old Nathan Cole is also very concerned about the partisanship he sees in our politics and how it affects his candidate options. I was a registered Republican since 18. And then two years ago, I changed my party affiliation to Libertarian. And about a year ago, I changed now to Independent completely. I think being a millennial, and I, I can speak, at least for my, my friend group, there's been a lot of people that have left the Republican Party, and they see what's going on with the Democratic Party. And a lot of us are now okay, well, we agree with the Democrats on this stuff, but also with the Republicans on this stuff. So it's it's not black and white like it was 20, 30 years ago. And with the extremists on both sides, whether it's the, the progressives on the far left or you know the far right candidates that deny that elections are fair and just, which is a cardinal part of our democratic system. I can say that. I believe in the Constitution. I'm not going to idolize one person or one party. Moderates like me uh, and independents that left the Republican Party are not going to 
vote Republican just because we were Republican. I think that that's a change now. We are not so much seeing um, the the party um, priority that you did in past generations, not with millennials and not with at least my, again, very small peer group. Joseph Garcia is 61 and also lives in Metro Phoenix. And he's a recognized voice among the Metro Phoenix Latino community. A Democrat, uh, became an independent. I, I, you know, I couldn't even tell you how many years ago. It's probably been, you know, 25 years or more. Some friends and I were talking one time, we're having a couple of beers and they were both the uh, Republicans and I was a Democrat and we debate and, you know, talk about politics and so forth. And then we found ourselves agreed in, in the middle a lot, certain things we could agree on, uh, certain things we couldn't, but we could certainly see each other's point and respect each other's point. And then we realized that, you know, there's, there's more in common there than, than we thought. So we made a pack, all three of us decided to become independents. And, uh, and not having to feel like we have to defend the party lines all the time. And, and, you know, that's, that's where we've been. All three of us are still independents to this day. When I asked if Joseph views his voting patterns as in the middle, he pushed back this way. Well, I don't consider myself in the middle. I consider myself independent of either party. And, and I think that allows me a certain uh, invitation to walk into either camp and talk to Republicans or talk to Democrats as myself, as just me, not representing a whole party with the, you know, all, all the sins and failures because both parties have them, uh, but rather as myself and talk as somewhat of a, a non-vested observer and, and participant, but not one who's beholden to a party. You know, so I don't feel like I'm like in the middle, I'm Mr. Moderate. And I mean, I don't look at it that way. Some issues I'm, you know, I'm very, very progressive. Other issues, I'm, I'm, you know, more conservative. It isn't a matter of moderate. It is a matter of independence from party dogma. And that's, that's what I am. I think at the end of the day that we have to do what we can to protect our democracy and protect what this country represents. That's Susan Lassiter Lyons again. She wants all voters to really consider this as they fill out their ballots. I mean, if I could sum it up in, in a word, it would be consequences. We've seen that. Um, the result of our 2016 selections um, and kind of the lingering impact that it's had on our democracy and on kind of the current chaotic state of our union. So when we're voting, when we're making these choices and making these decisions, I think that it's important for people to consider the long-term consequences, right? What is the long-term consequence of putting an election denier, okay, somebody that very much doesn't believe in the rules or norms of democracy in a position of power after we have seen firsthand what that leads to. I mean, what's the consequence of that? Consider that. What is the consequence of putting someone in a position of power who has even floated the idea of privatizing Social Security? When, you know, speaking as someone who's 57 years old and is, I'm not going to lie, looking forward to starting to draw some Social Security in a few years that I've paid into liberally over the many, many years that I've been a productive working member of the society. What are going to be the long-term consequences of putting somebody in a position of power who just doesn't have any policies, doesn't stand for anything, doesn't, doesn't have a plan to make things better, but just wants to insert themselves in a situation to keep you know, a certain status quo that only works for just a certain group of our population? What are some of the other issues or concerns that these voters brought to your attention? Education was a big one. Also, abortion access was high on the list of many people for both men and women. Here's Jacqueline DeVoli again. As a woman and a mother of a teenage daughter, I very much am interested in bodily autonomy and right to choice. That doesn't mean I want to run out and say everyone should have an abortion. To me, it's about choices and my choice is my choice, and my choice, my, I might not even do that myself, but it's my choice. 
and it's not for me to tell anyone else what to do with their bodies and lives. That is a huge issue for me because I think it is a slippery slope once we start attacking bodily autonomy. But that aside, and the economy aside, you know, my husband and I are small business owners, so we very much understand <laughs> the economy and inflation. And the last two years have been a, a bit of a wallop. We very much understand that. What I'm very disappointed in with our state elections in general, I can't find, and if it's out there, maybe I'm just not looking enough. I'm very concerned about water in this state. I'm concerned about climate issues in this state. And I don't know that our state is doing enough to not just secure our water rights, but make sure that we are playing well with others because we all have to be in this together. And also thinking about what's going to happen if there isn't enough water or if the, in the climate's only getting warmer. I've told my husband, do we need to consider moving somewhere where there's fresh water, somewhere where in 50 years, it might not be super cold, but it's cold now. Um, I thought about this a lot and it, I, I love Arizona. It's my state. I, I never envisioned living anywhere else. So I would really like to see more things like that discussed. And I just don't think that that's happening. Abortion? Yeah, that is a big, big issue. This is Richard Sinclair again. My prediction is there's going to be millions of women across this country who vote on one point, And I think they should. I mean, this, these draconian laws of absolutely positively no abortion is just ridiculous. I mean, what about a tubular pregnancy? A woman's going to die because she can't have a tubular pregnancy corrected? You know, you've got a bunch of men making these decisions. And they don't have to worry about it, you know, but every woman has to worry about it. And uh, I feel that is justifiably one of the major issues of this election cycle. Al Bell pointed out that there are essentially five major issues for him and for many independents. Water, education, uh, immigration, the economy, certainly, housing, portability, and they all are fundamental to our success as a society. And we just have to make some progress and not continue playing games with them. And there, yes, there are some positive steps that have been taken on two or three fronts on water. There's a, a first step, education, sort of a first step, but the need is so huge that we don't even have our arms around it yet. Immigration is a, it's got to be a, a, a real partnership with the, the feds because of the authority issue. And we can certainly contribute a lot to it. We have to, because it's right here in our, our front door. But all of these things are just fundamental to the functioning of our society and the long-term prosperity of, of, of the state. And there are no perfect solutions but there are certainly better solutions than the standoff that now passes for answering those issues. Jim Morrison has several key concerns as a voter. I think education resonates with me because that is really, really important to the future of our country. And I think our K-12 system is in big trouble. I'm an advocate of school choice unabashedly an advocate of school choice. <laughs> but I also think that a nation that cannot have its sovereign borders protected is not much of a country. And while I think the world of the people who come willingly and want to work and want a better life and all of that, but there's a process, and I think they have responsibility to honor that process. Both parties are at fault because... When they have a weird issue, they don't want to ever resolve it. Uh, and the Republicans have a weird issue, and there are many factions in the Republican Party that like the cheap labor that works in the shadows, <laughs> doesn't have full rights. And many Democrats uh, 
like that, although the unions have a problem with it, but many of them think that demographics is destiny and they made a misjudgment. They assumed that Hispanic Americans were going to behave precisely and totally like Black Americans at play and be a loyal constituency. And I think that's proven not to be the case, but I don't know that it's enough to make them change uh, their attitude about it. So we have to deal with the border in a comprehensive way. And uh, those are two issues that are uh, uh, troublesome to me. Mm -hmm. uh, inflation and economy, I know that it's hurting a lot of people. You know, we're, we're not in the acquisition mode and we're financially secure. And so, um, I mean, I notice when I go to the grocery store and I'll come back and remember, wow, I paid X amount for this, you know, but it's not totally changing anything. But uh, I understand that it is for a lot of people. And uh, for that, I think, again, I'm concerned about the reckless spending <laughs> that has produced it. I guess we're just off on the wrong track nationally. Arizona, I don't know how the legislation got so distorted. It is, it's really, uh, we have some, we have some real lulus in the legislature and apparently no regard for any moderate voice. So we're in a hell of a mess. <laughs> Here's Carolyn Van Oosten again. I've been in higher education for over 20 years, and I really feel like we're not, again, just little quick fixes, band-aid solutions, not really looking at the root cause of these issues and not really taking a hard look and, and finding out where we can make big changes that are going to have big impacts down the road. An early childhood education, for example, let's at least tackle one thing and then you could set up these kids for to have a really good future and be prepared to go to school instead of having them just kind of tumble along and then find their way. Nathan Cole is very concerned about inflation. Inflation is my second biggest um, issue. Again, with my limited view of the world, I'm a millennial. I would like to buy a house one day. <laughs> and I say one day because it is seems like the, it's a never-ending tunnel of, uh, and it's just fading away. I see in my everyday life high grocery prices, high gas prices, and I can safely say these are things that every you know middle class and below person will see, um, and that's what affects them the most. I mean, I, being a man, I, I understand that abortion um, is a huge deal, but I, I see that you know inflation is is a little bit it's it's getting to a point where it's just going to be unsustainable to live and uh, lots of people are not going to be able to afford houses yeah i think that's a it's a self-explanatory topic to go into that that leads me into you know abortions and, and individual rights i do i do believe in that um now there is no legal uh, determination on when life starts. Um, that is something that I think is going to have to be determined. I don't have a right answer for that. Um, it's not my job, I guess, but I would like to see that. And so if we could have our, uh, I guess, local government, I, I'm again constitutionalist. I like small government because I think people in Arizona should be voting for people in Arizona and, you know, people in Phoenix should be represented by people of Phoenix and they should vote for laws in Phoenix. And if I'm in Phoenix, I shouldn't tell somebody in Flagstaff how to live their life. So I, I know it's a slippery slope, but that's, that's kind of my, my baseline. So same with abortion. Here's there. Mandy Snowden again. If you recall from earlier in this episode, she is an independent with Republican leanings, but her voting style has changed some, but her voting style has started to change. More recently, it's been mixed. And the most recent election, it's, I haven't quite finished all my research and filling out the ballot yet, but I actually have been voting almost all Democrat. When I'm doing research, trying to figure out who I'm voting for, I look at their opinions and their, their views and their voting record, if they have one, on as many varied issues as possible, including inflation, um, economic policy, 
abortion policy is very important to me. Um, and education also is a really big one. I, I guess the only other thing that has really been weighing on me in terms of this election is abortion. And it's, it's, it's a, I'm in a weird place on this topic because I've been pro-life my whole life and I still consider myself pro-life. But um, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, this is an opportunity for um, lawmakers and for voters to really look at this issue and figure out what needs to be addressed. I, I have yet to see any abortion policy one way or the other that seem to address all of the nuances that are involved in, in that topic. Um, so ultimately, where I've landed on it for now is that I'm not going to vote for a candidate you know, all, all other things aside, but I'm, I'm not going to support a candidate's view that says that all abortion should be illegal or the doctor should be criminalized or anything like that. I am leaning more towards a more liberal approach towards abortion in the lawmaking um, sector, whereas it needs to be more of a change of a culture of life in, in the culture itself. Ellen Rausch, who we heard from earlier, lives in Tucson now, but is originally from New York City. She was a staunch independent there and even ran for a small local office. Coming to Arizona, she felt isolated politically. In New York, even though, of course, it was a very Democratic city, and then the upstate was very Republican for the most part. Um, you still had choices. You still maybe had the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, or maybe as the Independence Party came into being, you had that. So there seemed at least there was a fight. When I moved to Tucson, which was generally understood to be a Democratic city within a Republican state, for the most part, it was really hard for me to be an independent because anytime I would kind of challenge the party system, they're like, oh my God, you can't say anything against the Democrats because we're fighting so hard against the Republicans. I couldn't really find independents. It was really hard to find other independents. I became kind of offensive to my Democrat friends, <laughs> you know, that I was challenging voting for a Democrat. I would describe Ellen as a rigorous independent who also does thorough research on each candidate and ballot measure. And she makes sure to ask candidates about including independents and creating open primaries in particular. A common sentiment among all the independents I talked to was frustration with those who marched in lockstep with their own party. Here's Paul from North Phoenix again. The number one issue for me is Canada's stand on the 2020 election. If a candidate has taken the position that that it was a lost election to Republicans that, you know, Trump lost, that Trump's loss was rigged, then, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a non-starter. I mean, you know, it, it's clear, no evidence anywhere that there was any kind of issue. So, it, you know, if a candidate is espousing the position that, that uh, the election was stolen, then they're off the list. They're just off the list. I couldn't vote for somebody that takes that position. It, it really makes me wonder about somebody, you know, like Lake or Fincham or Hamaday, who has come out so strongly behind the former president and, you know, has sought his uh, endorsement. You know, what did they have to do to get that endorsement? I mean, you know, did they have to sign some sort of loyalty oath to the former president? You know, they said they'll support him no matter what. I, uh, you know, the loyalty of the candidate is to the citizens of Arizona. That's first, last, and always. And uh, I, there's just no confidence that someone that takes the position that the election was stolen from the former president would always be on the side of the Arizona citizen. Joseph Garcia shared this observation. Things have changed over time. Uh, there was a time when you could look at the ballot and you would you would vote accordingly on issue and candidates and not so much party. But parties were different then. 
And and I think the reason for being an independent are even more prevalent today because you have two parties that are not only polarized, but going in opposite directions. And I, I think one of the biggest problems this country has in terms of, of dealing with real issues for real people uh, in real time every day is that we're stuck in this two-party system that is broken. It no longer works. Uh, it used to be the two parties would bring their ideas to the table. They would hash it out and come up with some compromise. Now, that's not always the case, but for most cases, that is largely what happened. Uh, now it's, it's a, a one vote or two vote majority in a, uh, in a, in a deliberative body, you know, a house or a Senate, you know, whether it be state or national and that rules the day, you know, one vote and it shouldn't be that way. But again, it's the problem of a broken system. Election integrity is really important. This is Bill Regner from Clarkdale again. And the belief in that, and I think anything that undermines that and suggest that there are issues that are that can't be demonstrated with any kind of facts and any evidence. I think um, we're going in the wrong direction by creating obstacles to people voting. And I believe in government. I believe in, in that process. It's important. Even for those who leaned slightly more to the conservative side on certain issues, made it clear that there is a line they will not cross. Here's Susan Lassiter Lyons from Florence again. I'm a never Trumper. So look, the very first president I ever voted for was Ronald Reagan. Okay. That appealed to me. Then, like in one of the elections, Romney. And I remember thinking, like, I'm totally going to vote for Romney. Right. Um, I had voted for Clinton because I really I like that moderate approach. Mainly, I consider myself a fiscal conservative and a social liberal or a social moderate, let's say now. But under Clinton, we had a balanced budget. We had a surplus. In fact, uh, we had, you know, some issues with like overvaluation in the stock market with tech stocks, certainly. But I mean, we didn't have anything catastrophic. It was good times, you know? I mean, I look back at that part of my life from a business perspective and like a personal perspective financially, and it's like, those were good times. Like we made some serious progress during that time. And then Romney came on the scene and had a lot of the same policies. And coming from Massachusetts, he was one of the first governors that, uh, you know, was in favor of legalizing gay marriage. He was pro-choice, but he still had, you know, that fiscal conservative businessman approach that really appealed to me. Um, and then the religious right got a hold of his campaign to kind of mold him into the, you know, the prototypical Republican candidate. And so he had to flip flop on gay rights and abortion. And that's when he lost me. Right. So I've long said to anybody who will listen <laughs> that as an independent, right, and a fiscal conservative and a social liberal, that if the Republicans could run candidates that were cool with marriage equality and pro-choice, I would vote Republican and I would probably register Republican and vote that way every single time. But they can't and they won't. And so I don't. And that's why I remain an independent and an issues-based voter. Nathan Cole also arrived at the conclusion that he couldn't vote for election deniers. In my small view of the world, Election denialism is definitely my priority. Um, automatically, if someone comes up and a candidate says, uh, whether it was, you know, it was happening on the left side too in 2016 with Hillary Clinton saying the Russians stole the election from Donald Trump. Um, and, you know, there was never any evidence behind that. And we spent tens of millions of dollars researching to that. And that was a huge waste of taxpayer money. Flash forward that that set kind of the that kind of set the baseline that then President Trump kind of led into with his latest. So if you know Secretary of State, I think the AG and the governor, you know we we have candidates that are actively denying 
um, and saying that that election was stolen. And, and they're saying this without any proof of evidence. Um, Arizona, I know for a fact, has been doing mail-in voting probably the longest, uh, as one of the longest histories uh, of doing that in the country, just due to our agriculture background as a state. Um, we have a great system. Um, uh, the re- county recorder, uh, Stephen Richer from Maricopa County, has done an outstanding job, himself being a uh, lifetime Republican. And he's just now been absolutely targeted by the the Trumpers. And I just, I, I can't stand um, for people that are taking the foundation of democracy and they're utilizing it um, as a, I guess, weapon for lack of a better term, saying that if I don't win, um, it's because it was stolen from me. I've been an athlete my whole life, and that's not how it is in the sports world. Um, if you get beat by something, you, you just accept your loss and you say, yeah, I, I understand. I'll be better next time and come out and win. You don't claim the other side cheated right off the bat. For Richard Sinclair, the growing divide between right and left and the intensifying polarization made him cut ties with any single party. Frankly, it grew out of my sense of frustration. So that this year, things have gotten just so divisive. And so, I mean, the attack on democracy it just really eats at me and my wife. Um, the, you know, the Trump tribe, the deniers, the, the lies, uh, the perversions of, of the whole system, uh, and, you know, the total corruption of the Republican Party. That really, really eats at me and my wife, and most everyone else, you know, uh, even people who still claim to, you know, friends that still claim to be Republicans admit that, you know, life would be better if Trump would go away. Uh, beyond that, certainly, I'm, I've been disgusted about those, the lack of any type of correct immigration reform in this country. Uh, we need immigrants in this country. We can't run this country without immigration. Yeah, go to check into a hotel. Oh, yeah, we'll give you a room at eight o'clock. We don't have enough people to make up rooms. You know, who's picking the fruit? Who's cleaning the dishes? I mean, it just goes on and on. This country does not work without immigrant help. But beyond that, there's a you know, tremendous number of them come, you know, second generation. The first, first, you know, generation was a, you know, worked in a, a laundry or was a gardener, and the second generation graduated from ASU. And they're, they're doing wonderful things. And they're, they're great, yeah, educated people that we need in this, this con- country, in this economy. So I'm very concerned about that. But why switch to independent rather than the opposite party? For Al Bell, that's a decision between bad and worse. It felt to me like it would be just jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Because... My sense of both parties is they are locked into their own perspective on the world. And it's by nature incomplete. Granted, they have different priorities, they assert that they have different values, but they approach governing the nation, governing Arizona, as if the part they don't agree with didn't exist. And it's that mentality that I, I found that I couldn't accept. I, I vote now mostly for Democrats because increasingly that's the only choice I have. I hope that will change. But I really think that a, a duopoly or governing as diverse a nation, as diverse a state as we actually have is structurally unsound. It's because it's simply incomplete. And it's especially so now that the Republican and Democratic parties have decided they're really just two scorpions in the bottle. And governance is sort of a fringe operation that they eventually indulge in when they complete their campaign book garbage. So I guess I'm, to be honest with myself, with you, I'm, 
I'm not really uh, convinced that the two-party system is capable of serving our needs any longer. Lisa Schneble heidinger had this to say. The moderate middle dropped out, and therefore we are left playing to the fringes. Although I think Biden was clearly a moderate choice. Um, and some people say the Democratic Party closed ranks and kept Bernie Sanders out. And that's why things went the way they did. And had the parties lost power, Sanders may have gotten in. Maybe we're headed to a place where the parties will have less power. I don't know. Um, but it's if, if you're working somewhere, it seems like there's never any good employees. And if you're not working somewhere, all you want is a job. It seems like we should have the best and brightest dying to step up and lead our country and our state and our counties. But it also seems like, and I've talked to a Republican state rep who was pulled aside and told if he was seen speaking to a Democrat, the party would vote him out. We have become so deeply polarized that I no longer want to run for the state legislature because I'd be scared, frankly. And somehow we've got to get back to being moderate middles and the ends. And boy, if I could figure that out, I would take my helicopter to my next lunch. But I still think that's what needs doing. It sounds like many independents are reaching similar conclusions this election cycle. That's true. But it's important to note that independents are not monolithic. Their views are as diverse as they are. And the people I spoke with, again, are just a small amount of this enormous voting bloc. I liked how Lisa from Flagstaff put it. I think there is the glimmering awareness that independents are the quiet monster, the quiet force, the unrealized power. Anybody who doesn't recognize the value in courting independence would be missing a big boat. What we've lost is the collegiality that existed in Arizona when I was coming up, when Mo Udall in Congress and Barry Goldwater in the Senate created the CAP, when Dennis DeConcini in Arizona's Senate and Sandra Day O'Connor worked across the aisles to bring things about. And I don't know if the polarized ends will ever even want to talk again, but my hope lies in the independent voter for that purpose, to be a, a correlative, palliative, um, joining force when the ends seem to have just thrown up their hands and given up on one another. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Kaylee Monahan, audio producer for the Arizona Republic, Thank you for joining me today in front of the mic for a change. <laughs> it's my pleasure. And I have to say, all the people I spoke with had such thoughtful and deeply meditated answers. There's a lot from the conversations that I just couldn't fit into today's episode. But my biggest takeaway is that you can't lump independence into a single camp. They have their own way of approaching the issues facing our society. Very good. If people want to follow your work, where can they find you on Twitter? I'm at Kaylee Monahan. That's K-A-E-L-Y M-O-N-A-H-A-N. And that is it for this episode, Gaggle listeners. Thank you to all the voters who spoke with us for this episode. We couldn't have done it without you. And if you have questions about Arizona's political landscape, you can leave us a message at 602-444-0804 or email us at thegaggle at arizonarepublic.com. And that's one word all spelled out. And don't forget to rate and review our show and share it with a friend. If you want to reach out to me on Twitter, I'm at Ronald J. Hansen. That's H-A-N-S-E-N. Today's episode was edited and produced by Kaylee Monahan with help from Amanda Liberto. Thanks for listening to The Gaggle a podcast from the Arizona Republic and azcentral.blah. I can just feel it. My mouth is like, you got to quit. Take a break. Let me do that last graph again. Thanks for listening to The Gaggle, a podcast from the Arizona Republic and azcentral.com. We'll see you next week.